The title of this talk is Taking Action in Light of God's Word. And for those of you who have Bibles with you, will you take a minute to find Nehemiah in your Bible? Take a look at its location in the Old Testament. You notice where it is? Right in the middle, right? Kind of like right in the middle before you get to Psalms. Nope, it's not right in the middle. It's at the end. Now, you're, puzzling. you're puzzled because it looks like it's in the middle of your Old Testament. But it's at the end of the chronological books recording the history of Israel in the Old Testament. There's a lot more scripture that follows it, the wisdom literature, the Psalms, um, prophetic utterance. But in Nehemiah, we get the last glimpse of Old Testament history before the curtain comes down and the silence of 400 years begins only to be broken by the angels singing about the birth of the Messiah. Nehemiah is an Old Testament narrative that shows God's people mercifully returning from exile in accordance with God's promises, but at a very great point of need. Israel is no longer a magnificent kingdom, but a weak, conquered remnant. They're rebuilding a broken down city led by a man whose only visible qualification for such a thing is that he follows God. Let's jump right into the text. I'm going to read the whole of chapter 1 and 2 and see what we can learn as 21st century women who want to be faithful to God's word. This will take a while, follow along, and then we'll go back and look at the bits. The words of Nehemiah, oh, by the way, guys, if, pastors, if you know that I'm mispronouncing these words, you can fix it later when you talk because I'm just making it up. I think I've got Nehemiah right. <laughs> the words of Nehemiah, son of Hakaliah, in the month of Kislev in the 20th year when I was in the citadel of Susa, Hanani, one of my brothers, came from Judah with some other men and I questioned them about the Jewish remnant that had survived the exile and also about Jerusalem. They said to me, those who survived the exile are back in the province, are in great trouble and disgrace. The wall of Jerusalem is broken down and its gates have been burned with fire. When I heard these things, I sat down and wept. For some days, I mourned and fasted and prayed before the God of heaven. Then I said, Lord, the God of heaven, the great and awesome God who keeps his covenant of love with those who love him and keep his commandments, let your ear be attentive and your eyes open to hear the prayer your servant is praying before you night and day for your servants, the people of Israel. I confess the sins we Israelites, including myself and my father's family, have committed against you. We have acted very wickedly toward you. We have not obeyed the commandments, decrees, and laws you gave your servant Moses. Remember the instruction you gave your servant Moses, saying, if you are unfaithful, I will scatter you among the nations. But if you return to me and obey my commandments, then even if your exiled people are at the farthest horizon, I will gather them from there and bring them to the place I have chosen as a dwelling place for my name. They are your servants and your people, whom you redeemed by your great strength and your mighty hand. Lord, let your ear be attentive to the prayer of this your servant and to the prayer of your servants who delight in revering your name. Give your servant success today by granting him favor in the presence of this man. I was cupbearer to the king. In the month of Nisan, which, by the way, is 18, 16 weeks later than Kislev when he got the news, that's important. In the month of Nisan, in the 20th year of King Artaxerxes, Artaxerxes, when wine was brought for him, I took the wine and gave it to the king. I had not been sad in his presence before, so the king asked me, why does your face look so sad when you are not ill? This can be nothing but sadness of heart. I was very much afraid. Nobody wants to hear the troubles of the help. But I said to the king, may the king live forever. Why should my face not look sad when the city where my ancestors are buried lies in ruins and its gates have been destroyed by fire? The king said to me, what is it you want? Then I prayed to the God of heaven and I answered the king. If it pleases the king and if your servant has found favor in his sight, let him send me to the city in Judah where my ancestors are buried so that I can rebuild it. Then the king, with the queen sitting beside him, asked me, How long will your journey take and when will you get back? If it pleased the king to send me, so I set a time. 
I also said to him, if it pleases the king, may I have letters to the governors of Trans-Euphrates so that they will provide me safe conduct until I arrive in Judah. And may I have a letter to Asaph, keeper of the royal park, so he will give me timber to make beams for the gates of the citadel by the temple and for the city wall and for the residence I will occupy. And because the gracious hand of my God was on me, the king granted my requests. So I went to the governors of Trans-Euphrates and gave them the king's letters. The king had also sent army officers and cavalry with me. When Sanballat the Horonite and Tobiah the Ammonite official heard about this, they were very much disturbed that someone had come to promote the welfare of the Israelites. I went to Jerusalem, and after staying there three days, I set out during the night with a few others. I had not told anyone what God had put in my heart to do for Jerusalem. There were no mounts with me except the one I was riding on. By night I went out through the valley gate toward the jackal well and the dung gate, examining the walls of Jerusalem which had been broken down and its gates which had been destroyed by fire. Then I moved on toward the fountain gate and the king's pool, but there was not enough room for my mount to get through, so I went up the valley by night, examining the wall. Finally I turned back and re-entered through the valley gate. The officials did not know where I had gone or what I was doing because as yet I had said nothing to the Jews or the priests or the nobles or officials or any of the others who would be doing the work. Then I said to them, you see the trouble we are in. Jerusalem lies in ruins and its gates have been burned with fire. Come, let us rebuild the wall of Jerusalem and we will no longer be in disgrace. I also told them about the gracious hand of my God on me and what the king had said to me. They replied, let's start rebuilding. So they began this good work. But when Sanballat the Horionite, Tobiah the Ammonite official, and Geshem the Arab heard about it, they mocked and ridiculed us. What is this you're doing, they asked. Are you rebelling against the king? I answered them by saying, the God of heaven will give us success. We are his servants. We, his servants, will start rebuilding. But as for you, you have no share in Jerusalem or any claim or historic right to it. This is the word of the Lord. Okay. We are in the season of summer action blockbuster movies. And living in New York City, you tend to meet people who know people who know people. So over the past year or so, I've had an occasional thought of trying to sell Nehemiah as the next action movie. <laughs> Although given what Hollywood did to Noah, maybe not. <laughs> if we try to imagine Nehemiah as an action movie, here's how it would open, I imagine. A dark, brooding shot pans the destroyed walls surrounding Jerusalem. The stones are tumbled down, the gates are just piles of firewood still smoking. The inhabitants, a small and hearty collection of returned exiles, are weeping and grieving. Quick cut to Susa, the location of King Artaxerxes' citadel. Hanani, who Nehemiah refers to as a brother, rides up with several others on tired and weary mounts. Kislev, the month is flashed on the bottom of the screen. <laughs> Gasping for breath, swallowing much needed water, Hanani reports to Nehemiah this fresh disaster. This is not the destruction of the walls of Jerusalem that took place in 587 BC under Nebuchadnezzar when the Jews were first taken into exile. That's old news. That was 70 years ago as the prophets Isaiah and Jeremiah had foretold first the northern kingdom of Israel, then the southern kingdom of Judah had fallen to pagan invaders. Nebuchadnezzar, at the head of the Babylonian army, had invaded, taken Jerusalem, destroyed the temple, broken the walls, and taken all the people in ca to captivity. But through all the years of exile, God's people had held on to the promise in Isaiah 44, 28, that there would be an eventual restoration. And in time, against all probability, pagan kings had begun to allow the captive exiles to return to their homeland. God was fulfilling his word. Let me read you just the last few verses in 2 Chronicles 36, verses 22 and 23. In the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, in order to fulfill the word of the Lord spoken by Jeremiah, the Lord moved the heart of Cyrus, king of Persia, to make a proclamation throughout his realm and also put it in writing. Remember that part, the writing part, that's important. This is what Cyrus, king of Persia, says. The Lord, the God of heaven, has given me all the kingdoms of the earth, and he has appointed me to build a temple for him at Jerusalem in Judah. Any of his people among you may go up 
and may the Lord their God be with them. Now as an aside, there's commentators who hypothesize that Cyrus was not only showing compassion to his enslaved uh, people by letting them go home, but he was also hedging his bets in letting them all go home and reestablish their own temples in worship. He figured that if they were all praying to their own gods for him, that somebody was sure to be paying attention somewhere and that he would be in good odor with some gods somewhere. So whatever Cyrus's motives were, God had promised through Isaiah and Jeremiah that Cyrus would be his shepherd. It actually uses that word, his shepherd, to rebuild Jerusalem and the temple. So here we see the first of many examples of the word of the Lord finding its fulfillment in the mixed motives of a pagan king. One of my favorite proverbs is, the heart of the king is in the hand of the Lord. And where do we see it here? Okay, back to Hanani's news to Nehemiah. This new destruction of the wall and the gates was of the rebuilding that had commenced, that had been sanctioned by Cyrus, king of Persia, when he began allowing the conquered people to return to their homelands and reestablish their worship and their culture. If you look in the book of Ezra, which is pretty much a companion piece to Nehemiah, we see that the first wave of exiles had returned under the leadership of Zerubbabel, whose first priority was to rebuild the temple so worship could recommence. The rebuilding had begun, the return had started, and then disaster. The officials of the Trans-Euphrates region reported to King Artaxerxes, that's Nehemiah's king, remember, concerning the progress in Jerusalem, and Artaxerxes stopped the building, the rebuilding of the wall, lest Jerusalem become secure again and perhaps stop paying tribute and taxes. The king decided the work should stop until he had a chance to think it over and determine whether it was in his own best interest to let it continue. This was an unmitigated disaster. It was actually worse in some ways than the original destruction and exile that had been prophesied because the return of the exiles had been promised, it had begun, and now it seemed as though God's word which was being fulfilled had been stopped by evil men who had access to grind and didn't want to see Jerusalem be reconstituted. Without a secure wall to defend themselves from predators and raiders and the surrounding powerful nations, there would be no permanent restoration of Israelite culture. Their heritage, their way of life, it would cease. It would, they would be assimilated into the surrounding cultures. The law and the word of God would be forgotten as the remnant intermarried, and they all would just go away. There would be no more Israelite nation to bring forth God's promised Messiah. So the return of the exiles and the rebuilding of Jerusalem wasn't just the normal longing for a national homeland. It was a key ingredient in God's redemptive plan for the world because the Messiah was to come out of the Israelite nation and there wasn't one anymore and there was never going to be one unless this rebuilding took place. However, with the king's permission temporarily suspended, those surrounding tribes had lost no time in destroying the work that had begun. Now it looks like the return of the exiles and their resumption of their lives as a distinct Jewish people is in jeopardy. This was Hananiah's Hanan Hanani's news. Okay. Pan to Nehemiah's face. Something has to be done. Something will be done. He will be the one to do it. He leaps into action and sits down to weep and pray or God, to God for four months. This is where I think I might lose the interest of any potential movie maker <laughs> that I might have had up to this point. He leaps into action and prays for four months. In our short attention span world, it does not look like it, but Nehemiah is actually hard at work. We would focus on the presenting problem. The walls are broken, the gates are burned, the remnants at risk, come up with a plan of action and address the circumstance. Fix the circumstance. Let me just say as an aside, circumstances can often be very painful, but they are rarely our biggest problem our sickness or our money problems, our singleness or our marriage problems, our kids or our infertility, these are hard, but they are not our deepest 
truest needs. Nehemiah has a much broader perspective than that. He knows how God has been working in history since the creation and fall and that the restoration of Jerusalem is but one part of the great story arc of redemption which will one day climax with the coming of the messianic king prophesied for so many years, actually all the way back to Eve in Genesis 3. So the action he takes is in light of God's word. Let me break out the rest of what I want to say under two headings. Nehemiah understood God's word, and Nehemiah's actions are based in confidence in God's word. First, Nehemiah understood God's word. Follow me here for a few minutes. The Bible is made up of many individual stories like Nehemiah's, but in truth it is only one story, the story of God redeeming his people and restoring his world. Some theologians will break this into four parts or sometimes three parts, creation, fall, redemption, restoration. Those are all helpful categories. But the overarching narrative is about the true Adam, the redeemer of the world, coming to redeem a people from every tongue, tribe, nation, and usher in the new heavens and the new earth. The Bible is about Jesus since before the foundation of the earth. He himself taught his disciples on the road to Emmaus. Luke 24, 27 says, beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. Earlier in John 5, 39 and 40, Jesus rebuked the Pharisees by saying, you diligently study the scriptures because you think that by them you will possess eternal life. These are the scriptures that testify about me. Yet you refuse to come to me for eternal, to have life. The Bible is not primarily about wisdom for living or promises of comfort or guidance for the perplexed. All those things can be found, it's true, but they are as shiny pebbles that distract our attention from the great highway running from ruin to renewal. If we read the scripture stories, the Psalms, the prophets, the law disconnected from the primary narrative arc of redemption, we will find them confusing and hard to apply properly to life today. Unfortunately, many of us are barely literate when it comes to the flow of redemptive history. We go to our Bibles for something for us to deal with our circumstances rather than to see how God is dealing with the world. But the Bible is not about us. It's about God and his plan to redeem his fallen, miserable world and restore it to the glory he first sang into being at creation. Nehemiah knew there was infinitely more at stake here than just the restoration of one people's national sovereignty. He's interpreting the present problem in light of the whole word of God. He actually alludes to this in his prayer, which we'll get to in a minute, and I think more fully in chapter 9, which, what, John Piper, that's you, chapter 9. Um, he'll get to that, I'm sure. We can't read the book rightly unless we understand all of this. We know in hindsight that the promise was going to be fulfilled through an individual, a Messiah. Nehemiah's whole work was to prepare the way for him, to have a rebuilt nation, city, temple, priesthood and sacrifices, a place where Jesus could grow up Jewish and be the true Israel, the final temple, the high priest, the ultimate sacrifice. Nehemiah didn't precisely know how he would, what he was doing would bring all this about, that's true. But he knew he had to be faithful to God's promises and his word. With far less excuse than Nehemiah, many of us are a bit fuzzy on how to read our Bibles and how to find direction for our actions in light of the whole word of God. For many of this, this is because we have been existing on a diet of artificial inspiration and devotionals rather than taking the time to sort out the scripture as a whole. Jesus says, all the scripture tells of me, and it does. God's redemptive plan was in place from the beginning, from before the foundation of the world. But if we read the Bible inattentively, 
or if we rely on feel-good devotional material as our only spiritual sustenance, we can miss the forest for the trees. Let me ask you all a question, and I'm going to ask for a show of hands, so be ready. How many of you are label readers when you go grocery shopping? You check the amount of fat, sugar, salt, preservatives? Okay. Here's another question for you. What would be your response if you took something off the shelf and discovered the ingredients were in this order, sugar, salt, wood ester alcohol, benzochromium hydroxate, artificial flavor, artificial color, and preservatives? I suspect that many of us would quickly replace that item on the shelf next to the bug poison, back away slowly, and then run for the organic food section. And yet we think little about feeding our souls with equally toxic non-food substances instead of the milk and the meat of God's word. People can find the word of God mysterious if not completely mystifying rather than do the work to unearth the inspired revelation of God so they turn to pre-processed soul junk food. By the way, I am not saying that you have to sign up for a seminary education, although I recommend that women be as theologically educated as possible. This can only be good for the church. It can be as simple as reading Jen Wilkins' excellent book, Women of the Word, which I recommend. In light of God's purpose to redeem his people from sin through his promise to Abraham, it is clear to see that Nehemiah is not just upset because the restoration effort seems to have stalled indefinitely. He's upset because God's people are still in disgrace. That's verse 3 in chapter 1. God's promises looked as if they had been frustrated by the designs of evil men. I love a good thunderstorm. I hope it's not a comment. Or I hope it's a good comment. Nehemiah is interpreting the present events and his own situation and gifts in light of God's word and in light of the main themes of the word. He doesn't need to ask for a sign or a fleece or an angelic visitor or even read a particularly appropriate devotional like a Christian version of a horoscope. Yeah, you've seen those. Nehemiah understood the word, he saw where they were in the stage of redemptive history, and he sought to enable his people to be the people of God so the Lord would continue his plan to save the world through them. Only when we can do the same thing can we read the Bible without falling into a kind of do this and God will bless me moralism. Then, of course, we can see lots of lessons on how to pray or handle, how to handle worry and face opposition. But those lessons will be tied to the gospel of salvation through Christ. The connector between Nehemiah's understanding of God's word and his subsequent action is his prayer in chapter 1. This is the bridge between in light of God's word and taking action. If you look at chapter 1, verses 6, and chapter 2, verse 1, Nehemiah says he was praying night and day, and they mention Kislev in the beginning and Nisan at the end. It indicates he was probably praying this prayer night and day for 16 weeks. Of course, the prayer in verses 5 through 11 has to be a summary of that long, long prayer time. But it shows the trajectory of his weeks of prayer. First, in verse 5, Nehemiah spends time just looking at God. Heavenly, great, awesome. And while, yes, he keeps his covenant of love, it's with those who love him and obey his commands. Nehemiah begins in a remarkably God-centered way, recognizing God's complete freedom. He actually owes us nothing. Derek Kidner says he begins by putting us in our place. It's not the way we as modern people usually pray, is it? We start with our own feelings and our needs, or if we start with God, we want to hear warm, fuzzy reassurances from him speaking to our hearts. Nehemiah, it seems, starts by getting his heart reoriented. Even the most godly people 
tend to lose perspective under the stress of a crisis, and Nehemiah doesn't want to let that happen to him. When we don't realize how infinitely great God is, this introduces all kinds of distortions into our thinking. We panic, we obsess, because we forget our God is infinitely great. Ironically, by admitting he knows us nothing, and that he is majestic and high and lofty, it brings more peace than lots of crying out with desperate petitions. In verses 6 to 7, after adoration comes confession. This is still before he gets to any petition. In this, Nehemiah is actually following the model that Jesus would put into the Lord's Prayer. Nehemiah confesses both his individual sin and the corporate sin of his people. Kidner says, this is Derek Kidner again, says that after adoring God's infinite highness and confessing our smallness, we realize God owes us nothing and therefore we come empty handed. There's no way we can put a claim on God and that's the only way we can come into his presence. Finally, in verses 8 to 10, this is still chapter 1, Nehemiah makes his appeal. Actually, it's chapter 2. And it's quite strong because it's based from, it's chapter 1. I'm looking at my notes, not my actual Bible, which my husband borrowed. <laughs> he forgot his. <laughs> Verses 8 to 10, Nehemiah makes his appeal to God based firmly on God's own word. He quotes Deuteronomy 9:29. God has promised to bring his people back from exile and reconstitute a nation and a house, Jerusalem and the temple, for God's name to dwell. He alludes to Exodus in verse 10, reminding God how he redeemed his people by his mighty hand. God has gone to a lot of trouble already to create this people, and now they need him to fulfill his promises in order to continue as a people. There were times in which the nation of Israel had sinned so badly as to be on the verge of extinction and final abandonment by God. But Moses had interceded in prayer and God's work with Israel went forward. Now Nehemiah is interceding in the same way. Again we see Nehemiah's prayer grounded in the word, in the history of salvation, and a conviction that God would fulfill his promises and continue his work of redemption. So, the first action, this title, remember, is taking action in light of God's word. The first action Nehemiah took was prayer. Similarly, our prayers should always be in light of the word. Our prayer life should be shaped and grounded in the scripture as often as possible as response to scriptural promises and statements about God. Immersion in God's word teaches us to pray the same way immersion in language teaches a baby how to speak the language of her parents. It will radically reorient us away from our self-absorption, giving us perspective, removing our worry and our panic through humbling us before God if we pray by praying scripture. Okay, now second, the second part taking action based on confidence in God's word. The end of chapter one, Nehemiah reveals two important pieces of information that will shape the action he's planned to take. First, he asks for God's favor with this man, who in the next sentence is revealed as Nehemiah's employer, none other than the king Artaxerxes, who you will remember is the one who suspended work on the rebuilding in Jerusalem. So that's gonna be a big stumbling block. As cupbearer to the king, Nehemiah had the trust and the access to the king that very few others would have had. Second, he decides to risk that position, and possibly his life, to ask for a major, huge personal favor. This was a risk of its own, but he approaches it in a very humble, vulnerable way. Verse 11 is actually striking, how, <laughs> that despite how slowly Nehemiah gets there, four months of praying, adoration, confession, all of it. When he gets there, he has a very specific plan and a very specific request worked out. He's going to go to the king directly using his position as cupbearer to get access and make a request and wait till you see the request he makes. 
It was a gamble because the king could be furious. In fact, in verse 3 of chapter 2, he says, I was very much afraid. And Nehemiah knew there was a lot on the line. This was the king that had stopped the work of rebuilding and allowed the marauders to destroy that half-built wall. And now Nehemiah was going to ask him to reverse that decision. Now I want to pause here for a minute to consider the sovereignty of God at work behind the scenes. This is so cool. Something we can see that Nehemiah had no knowledge of unbeknownst to him. We can go back in the book of Ezra and see events that had been unfolding at the highest level of red tape. Letters had been flying back and forth at the speed of camel between Jerusalem and Artaxerxes concerning the legality of the rebuilding. To begin with, in, the chapter, in chapter 4 of Ezra, Rehum and Shimshai write Artaxerxes accusing the Jews of rebuilding Jerusalem with a view of seceding from the empire and denying the royal coffers the taxes and revenues do it. Artaxerxes responds with his own letter, that's the stop work order, until he can think it over. The work comes to a standstill in the second year of the reign of King Darius of Persia, and this is probably when the destruction that Hanani brought news of took place. But in one of the most celebrated victories of clerks and paper pushers everywhere, and a shining example of God working behind the scenes through bureaucratic red tape, the letters continue. The governors of the region of the Trans-Euphrates, and that just means everything past the Euphrates River, there's a famous poster of New York City, you may have seen it, it shows Manhattan and the Hudson River and New Jersey, and then just this big blank area where the rest of the country is. That was kind of what Trans-Euphrates meant. Anything past the Euphrates River was like, hmm, there be dragons here. Anyway, the governors there and the, the little potentates of the region of the Trans-Euphrates, they write to Dari Darius again, tattling that the Jews have recommenced work without permission, defending their actions by saying, first, that God told them to, and second, that King Cyrus had given permission in the past, going so far as to return the gold and silver articles looted from the temple. They ask for a search of the royal archives of Babylon to see if this so-called decree of Cyrus's can be found and asking for an answer. Remember I told you it was important that Cyrus had written this down? King Darius issues the order, the archival search proceeds, and a memorandum is found. It actually says that in Ezra 6.2, memorandum. A divinely filed memorandum showing that Cyrus had indeed issued the decree, not merely permitting, but ordering the rebuilding of Jerusalem. Darius conveys this information to the governors, together with the surely unwelcome orders to assist the rebuilding with whatever is needed, money, animals for sacrifice, anything requested by the priests in Jerusalem. And the punishment for ignoring this order was to be impaled on a beam taken from their own house. Be careful what you ask for when you ask for a search of the royal archives. In the providence and omnipotence of God, Nehemiah's four months of prayer had been the means that God had used behind the scenes that would give him the success with the king that he had been praying for. But Nehemiah doesn't know anything about any of this. He's basing his actions merely on knowing that God will be faithful to the word he's spoken to bring the exiles back. Like his contemporary Esther, He's risen to his position for just such a time as this. So in verses 4 and 5, when the king asks what Nehemiah wants from him, Nehemiah makes his brief, famous arrow prayer, his inward prayer. And then after showing the king great deference, may the king live forever, he essentially goes for broke. If God is going to show him favor as he asks, if God is going to continue to fulfill his promise to bring the exiles back to their land and their heritage, it will be now. In verses 7 and 9, he asks to be allowed to return personally to Jerusalem. He asks to be allowed to rebuild it. Then he goes further and he asks for letters giving the royal seal of approval to his mission so he'll have safe passage. Oh, and one more thing, he asks for carte blanche to access the timber in the royal forest for the building project. The king even sent army officers and cavalry with Nehemiah on his journey back to Jerusalem, possibly as a token of his approval of the project and no doubt also for protection from hostile forces. 
Convinced that God had given him the favor of the king for which he prayed, Nehemiah just keeps asking. It reminds me of that line in John Newton's hymn, Thou art coming to a king, large petitions with thee bring. He's actually talking about us praying to God, but Nehemiah got the principle. Nehemiah demonstrated in an almost outlandish way his confidence in God's word. If you're going to ask in line with God's glory and to further God's redemptive purposes, ask big. Which reminds me, I made a note here, I wanted to mention John Reithard's book, Gospel Patrons. The king, for motives known only to himself, became Nehemiah's patron supplying him with whatever he needed to accomplish the task that God had given him. Uh, the book Gospel Patrons is more modern stories or stories of more modern day men and women of generosity who have supported gospel-led people and movements. While they're not the face of the movement, they were the givers who made it move, just as King Artaxerxes didn't lift a finger personally to rebuild Jerusalem. But without his patronage, Nehemiah couldn't have done what God called him to do it. So actually, if you get your hands on that, I do recommend that book. But returning to Nehemiah, his journey to Jerusalem is recorded in chapter 2, verse 11, with four words. I went to Jerusalem. It was another action taken on full trust and confidence in God's word. He left the world he had known, the privilege and security of the palace. He headed into an unknown opposition. There's no mention of the thousand-mile journey on camel, horse, foot with heat, sand, flies, discomfort and danger of all sorts. No, just, I went to Jerusalem. The rest was sort of beside the point. In verses 18, or 11 through 18, we see that Nehemiah allows himself three days of rest and recovery, and then he sets out to reconnoiter the damage for himself. Does he stop to ask, what do I, a cupbearer to the king, know about defensible walls, building codes, do it yourself? Action must be taken. He takes the action. This is a tangent, but I really want you to remember this. You can forget the rest of it. Often the way God calls you to a ministry is that you are the one that sees the need that others don't. Rather than haranguing your pastor or your elders or the person in the seat next to you about why they don't have a ministry to the elderly or why we're not doing vacation Bible school in that needy neighborhood over there or why we don't have this or that support for married couples, perhaps you are seeing the need because God is calling you to be the one who meets the need, who starts the ministry, who just starts doing it yourself. This is something I've observed many, many times in our 40 years in the ministry is there'll be somebody who's just really agitated because why isn't the church yet, yet, yet doing that? Well, you're seeing it and you're agitated because God has given you the ministry to do something about it. So the next time you have a burr under your saddle blanket about something, just consider it might be God who put it there. Okay. Yes, you may applaud that. Once in Jerusalem, Nehemiah goes on a secret overnight survey to inspect the walls from the outside so that any weaknesses apparent to the enemy would be visible to him. When he finally speaks to the remnant living in Jerusalem, comprised of priests, nobles, and officials, and just the ordinary people who would be actually doing the work, he gets them on board by recounting how God's hand had been with him up till then, including the interview with the king, and its abundant outcome. In referring to the disgrace of Jerusalem's brokenness, he is again using language referring to God's redemptive purposes. He locates their situation in redemptive history, not just the immediate need. They'd been disgraced, exiled, humbled because of their sin, but now God's promise to restore Israel as a nation was coming to fruition, and who wouldn't want to be a part of that? God's word was in the process of being fulfilled. Don't you want to get in on the action? In just these first two chapters, Nehemiah has abundantly shown us on many occasions how he has taken radical action based on his knowledge of God's word and redemptive promises. We have a lot to learn from him, how he acted, how he trusted, and the knowledge of the word of God that undergirded it all but that's not the main message.
You mean she hasn't even gotten to her first point? <laughs> Don't worry. Yes. The biggest message of Nehemiah is it's not about Nehemiah. All the scripture tells about who? Jesus. I've heard Nehemiah preach to someone who changed careers because he was pursuing his passion or referred to as a person who left the big company for a small startup because he was doing what he loved or even that he was a social activist trying to help the oppressed. All of that's plausible, but none of it's accurate. Because of his understanding of the word of God and God's plan to bless all the nations through Israel, Nehemiah determined that he should leave his secure place in the palace at the right hand of the king and go out into a dangerous situation where the chances not just of failure but of persecution and assassination were high. But he did it out of his understanding of God's promises and his redemptive plan. If we don't understand this ourselves, then when we read the Bible, perhaps we'll take away a list of wise principles of leadership to apply in situations that seem vaguely familiar. A building campaign to, to, to repair the church? Preach on Nehemiah. Opposition to God's purposes in the world? Think about how Nehemiah handled the opposition. I'm not deriding these principles. Some of them have great usefulness, and I'll just call out two of them that I mentioned in passing. I noted that Nehemiah inspected the broken wall from the outside. Did you see that go past? his enemies' vantage point in order to understand what his enemies would see as weaknesses. So, too, we ought to always try to understand the point of view of people who differ from us and to see what they see when they look at us in order to shore up our apologetic weaknesses and learn to speak in language that skeptics and unbelievers can understand. That's a good lesson. Or how about this one? When Ezra went to Jerusalem, and this is in Ezra 8.22, he specifically decided not to ask the king for soldiers and horsemen to protect him on the journey. His reasoning was that after claiming God's power to protect them, he would be ashamed to ask for human protection, as if he doubted God's power or willingness to watch over them. They even fasted and prayed about making this decision, and convinced it was the right one, he entrusted 12 priests and 10 of their brothers with a fortune in gold and silver to be used in the temple, and they set out on that dangerous thousand-mile journey with no escort from the king. When Nehemiah went on the same journey 13 years later, he gratefully accepted the armed escort as evidence that God was the one behind the king's favor. Raymond Brown and his commentary, The Message of Nehemiah in the Bible Speaks Today series, has this to say about the differing choices of Ezra and Nehemiah. I better talk fast before we lose our lights. I'm reading Raymond Brown. One man's commitment to God precluded the escort, the other welcomed it. Ezra regarded soldiers as a lack of confidence in God's power. Nehemiah viewed them as evidence of God's superlative goodness. Christians frequently differ on important issues, and it's a mark of spiritual maturity if they can handle those differences creatively rather than engaging in damaging verbal warfare. First century believers differed on some questions, and Paul urged them to stop passing judgment on one another. We're bound to think differently on occasions. Before we hastily judge other believers or ostracize them, we must make every attempt to understand and love them and discern what we can, learn from them, make every effort to do what leads to peace and mutual edification. That's Romans 14, 19. We must not rigidly stereotype believers into identical patterns of spirituality. This is the end of the Raymond Brown quote, but let me read it again. We must not rigidly stereotype believers into identical patterns of spirituality. Ezra and Nehemiah came to totally different conclusions. They fasted and prayed about it. They came up with different answers. God sometimes asks people to act in different ways. Let's be charitable with one another, okay? Two opposite strategies for glorifying God, both right. We should examine our hearts to see where we have baptized our own personal preferences or our cultural differences. 
and labeled any other practices as less honoring to God. God may have different plans for different people or different situations. But helpful and useful as those and other applications may be, they're not the point of Nehemiah. All the scriptures tell of me, Jesus said. Not only was Nehemiah playing his role in redemptive history by seeing that the Israelites were reconstituted as a people according to God's promise, so as to bring forth the shoot from the stump of Jesse, Jesus, David's greater son, Nehemiah himself was acting out the career of Christ. As an old-timey hymn we used to sing at the church that Tim had at the beginning in Hopewell, Virginia, out of the ivory palaces into a world of woe. Anyone know that one? It's first line of a bumpty bump him out of the ivory palaces into a world of anyway. um, Nehemiah literally left the palace and went to a broken world of woe where God's people were in need. He left privilege and safety for hardship and back-breaking labor. If he hadn't done it, Jerusalem would not have been rebuilt. There would have been no Jewish culture for Jesus to be raised in, no Jewish Messiah to redeem God's promises. Nehemiah was God's instrument in a critical moment of redemptive history, but his story is submerged in the greater story. Jesus is the greater Nehemiah, the one who left the heavenly palace, the right hand of the king, safety, glory, to come into a world. He joined the blue-collar labor force as a carpenter, a builder, hmm, and spent 30 of his 33 years building things. A builder. Hmm. He came not just at the risk of death, but with the certainty of it. But if Jesus had not done it, our salvation would not have been accomplished. In Nehemiah, we see an ordinary man, a man serving under the oppression, however benevolent, of a foreign power. What Nehemiah sees is his country in tatters, a shadow of its former glory under Moses, David, Solomon, self-destroyed and at its lowest point. He and others scrape together a small remnant that sets itself apart, resumes God-designed worship and lifestyle, and carries on, however heartbreakingly reduced in power and glory, the life of the covenant people of God. But it is enough. Let me say this loud, and let me say it clear, and let me say it twice. God's people do not need to be powerful culturally or in power politically to be obedient to him and accomplish his purposes in the world. First time. God's people do not need to be powerful culturally or in power politically to be obedient to him and accomplish his purposes in the world. All they need to do to glorify him and join the great sweep of redemptive history is to be faithful to the one who has called them by his own name. May we not do less than Nehemiah because we are called by the one who is greater than Nehemiah and he will accomplish it.